students, so far we have taken enough pains to understand the basics of microbiology which are sufficient in all regards for you to move forward and start addressing our pressing environmental concerns. One of the when we talk about environmental problems, one of the first concern that we have as human beings is our essential need of safe drinking water. We cannot last more than few days without access to water to drink and if that water is contaminated with microbes that are going to hurt us, going to make us fall sick, we will fall sick and then it will be a burden to public health. As such, one of the first priorities for environmental engineers is to ensure access to clean water. More than anybody else, in India we are very acutely aware that our surface water bodies are destroyed in terms that most of them are heavily contaminated with biological and chemical contaminants. It is quite but natural when a country that has such high population density and high population and limited, sub and limited surface water resources, we will have our surface water contaminated. And as such, it is even more important and imperative for environmental engineers such as you and me that we step up and understand the basics of the microbiology of drinking water and how we can take steps to clean it. So today my dear students we are going to explore the drinking water microbiology and we are going to look at those pathogens that are very common in our country India and that which damage our health. So let us start here with a general overview. So drinking what today we will cover the basics of drinking water treatment, pathogens that are of concern, fecal indicators versus molecular techniques and then as we move ahead we will talk about the different molecular biology and microbiological techniques that we have for detecting pathogens in water. So let us look at drinking water treatment. So if you have ever seen a lake or pond or a river and you are aware of how clean or dirty it is. Imagine what would it take for you to convert that dirty water into portable water that you can pour in a glass and drink up. The first step would be definitely to get rid of the large particulate matter. So here first step is removing sand gravel and other large particulates and once that has been done by sedimentation, so we allow these heavy particles to sediment because they are heavy, they sediment very easily. After this we can either undergo a coagulation process where this is a typical drinking water treatment train by the way. So we undergo a coagulation process where there are chemicals that coagulate the smaller uh, particles that did not settle in the primary settling tank. So what coagulant does is it neutralizes the charge of the flock and makes the flock to aggregate with each other and as such they become bigger particles and they settle. Let us look at coagulation process. So a typical coagulant is a salt of aluminum with triple um, electrons that it has given away and ferric which is called alum. This is a typical coagulant that, has, that is used in most laboratory and many drinking water and water treatment systems where we use the coagulation process to get rid of smaller particles. Now the heavier particles we have already allowed them to settle via gravity in the first sedimentation tank but then these lighter particles as they want to move down first they encounter like all other particles friction force which some people refer to as drag which is proportional to the velocity square and then they have the force of buoyancy which is pushing them up and the only thing calling them down towards the earth is gravity and for smaller particles settling will take tremendously amount of tremendously large amount of time something which we 
cannot afford because we have a thirsty population that we need to provide clean water to. So as such we want to accelerate this process, this process of the particles settling down. And the simple idea behind coagulation process is if we can take these small particles, get them to aggregate with each other and form large particles, then they will automatically settle down. To give you an idea, if you take mud and you put it in water, you will notice after some time and you mix it really well, okay. So after some time you will notice that the sand, stone and the grit have settled down towards the bucket where you had the water and the mud, but then still there is some turbidity in the water. The water is not perfectly clear. So the large particulate matter have settled down, but the smaller particulate mat matter are still floating and perhaps will remain in suspension for a very, very long time, a time that we can't afford. So we undergo coagulation where we use a typical coagulant like aluminum uh, oxide, ferric oxide, and this is alum, by the way. Now these are positively charged. Most of these flocks are negatively charged on their surface. And this is the reason why they are so stable. So these negatively charged particles, they repel each other, which is quite understandable, isn't it? So because like like repel each other. So when this alum and let us say Al plus 3, now remember Al plus 3 has lost 3 electrons and thus it is seriously electron deficient. deficient. So when Al plus 3 comes here, it neutralizes these charges, attracts these particles to it and what we see is a flock that forms with these particles aggregated around aluminum. And as they get neutralized, they are they permit themselves to aggregate and form a big particle. So this is a big particle now and this particle easily settles and then is removed as sludge. The second step in drinking water treatment then is to filter the water. So once we have coagulated the water and removed the sludge from here, we have clear water on the top that needs to be filtered. Why do we want to filter water? Because we want to get rid of the remaining particulate matters. There are still some particulate matters that for some reason, let us say their surface chemistry and their charges were such that the coagulant did not impact, did not encourage them to aggregate. Then we want to filter these particles and there are different kinds of filtration processes that we have. Most common in India are rapid sand and slow sand filters. Now these filters, when when the water passes through, th passes through these filters, there are at least three different phenomena that are at work which contribute to water becoming more clear. So the first phenomena, and I want you to remember this, the first phenomena obviously is mechanical filtering. The second phenomena, I want you to take a guess at it. The second phenomena is that as water filters, there are microbial communities in within the filter that develop biofilms and these biofilms attract, uh, cannot attract per se, but they capture the nutrients and thus they create a nutrient rich, rich environment in otherwise nutrient sparse drinking water. So we have biological removal of particulate matter. Now the simple question is what kind of particulate matter will biological agents remove? Because they are life agents, the only reason for them to interact with their surrounding in terms of consuming a particulate matter and destroying it or getting rid of it is food or electron. So if a particular do particulate can act as an electron donor or let us say in some cases electron acceptor or carbon source then they will definitely consume it. So a lot of organic material and certain electron acceptors and donors are removed because of biological phenomena. And the third is adsorption. At least in the initial phases of filtration when we have a new filtering unit and we run water through it, but adsorption plays important role. So usually the filter material, whatever its surface area is, it will have niches where particulate matter can come and form a hydrogen or some other weak bond and get adsorbed. So there are at least three phenomena in filtering that is happening. Over the long run, however, adsorption plays little role because most of the spaces on which the particulate matter could adsorb are already taken away. 
and biological removal's importance becomes more as bi biological agents or the microbial communities become stronger and more robust over time. Mechanical filtering as mechanical filtering has really good efficiency, but then after a while the filter gets clogged and needs to be washed. Most rapid sand filters and slow sand filters have a very neat mechanism for backwashing and clearing away the particulate matter that are clogging the way for mechanical filtering. So after filtration, we have chlorination in this diagram. Basically, this is disinfection. In India, this is the most common way of disinfecting. We add some kind of chlorine molecule in which the chlorine has the opportunity to oxidize cellular membranes and destroy the cell components. And um, we use bleaching powder, we use uh, chlorine gas primarily in India. And in certain parts of other countries like US, people use chloramines as well. The, this, the purpose of disinfection step is to ensure that microorganisms, okay, we have got rid of particulate matter. So, water looks clean and probably does not have toxic chemicals in it. <laughs> we hope so, it does not have toxic chemicals in it. And then we have disinfection where we get rid of microbes. So, microbes who were not removed during the process of settling, coagulation and filtration will now be removed in the process of disinfection. So, that is the first objective of disinfection. The second objective is that the some amount of disinfectant must stay in the water so that when this water goes to distribution system or water supply system, nothing can grow in the pipes because the disinfectant is still present. And if, if by chance there is corrosion or there is some breakage and loss in integrity of the water system, if pathogens intrude into the drink, uh, water supply system, this disinfectant will ensure that the microbes will die and by the time water reaches the tap of the consumer, it will still be portable. So, after chlorination, we have storage. So, we store them in water storage tanks and then we supply in our distribution system. This is our finished water. Now, notice here and this is uh, I believe a highly un a high underestimation of the actual number of typhoid cases, but the idea for you to understand is that when filtration was discovered, just the basic filtration. So, we knew how to do coagulation and we knew how to filter the water, there was a remarkable decrease in number of typhoid cases. And when chlorination or disinfection was discovered, there was even more remarkable decrease in number of typhoid cases. But typhoid, by the way, is a disease that is uh, that people acquire by drinking contaminated water and eating contaminated food. So, when we started cleaning our water, we had at least a 10 to power 2 re reduction in typhoid cases. So, this is showing you the power of a simple technique such as water treatment. Now, because we environmental engineers know how to do it, we play a big role in contributing to good public health. However, we st this is uh, data from US by the way, however, we still note that every now and then even in developed nations, we will have drinking water outbreaks, we will have recreational water outbreaks. So, this is the water you drink, this is the water you get exposed to. Interestingly, recreational water outbreaks in the US have increased in last decade, last two decades. So, when we talk about diseases and I mentioned that there are two kinds of water that we are interested in drinking water and recreational water, it implies that not just by drinking water, but there are other ways to get diseases through water. So, let us look at the four different kinds of diseases that are associated with water. First, we have water borne diseases. Now, these are most of the diseases that we are very, very interested in India. So, if the water has the contaminant, if the water has a pathogen or the microbe that will make us fall sick, then if we drink this water and we fall sick, then this kind of disease is water borne disease. Examples are cholera, typhoid and other bacillary disease, uh, bacillary dysentery and trachoma. Now, let us uh, talk about cholera. Cholera and typhoid, all these diseases are often fecal oral, uh, they have a fecal oral transmission route, which implies is that somebody somewhere pooped and the feces of that person, that person was perhaps a sick person and because of that sick patient pooping in a place in an environment where these microbes in the pathogens in his poop could go and contaminate the drinking water and then people who drank the drinking water fell sick. 
Now water wash diseases. These are diseases that spread mainly because we don't have enough water to maintain hygiene. You must have heard and if you have not, I'll provide links anyway. So you, I, I, I encourage you to go through those links and take a look. And if you have uh, any chance at internet, please look into water.org. It's an organization that's ensuring people have sufficient water and clean water. So get rid of water wash diseases as well as water borne diseases. Now water wash diseases are those diseases where people cannot maintain their cleanliness. So they have dirty hands. They go, children are playing around and they touch mud which has fecal droppings of humans and other animals. They pick up on diseases and then they don't have soap and water to clean hands so they eat right away or they don't have awareness about it. So, but mostly because they don't have enough water to ensure complete hygiene. These diseases are called water washed. Some examples are general dysentery and trachoma again. So notice there is little difference between water borne and water washed diseases. So a waterborne disease would look like this. We have contaminated environment. Now this could be your liquid environment like a pond. So this is liquid environment. This is soil. So there could be animal droppings on this soil, animal or human dropping. And because most of us live in environments where human population is much more than animals, so it's mostly human dropping mostly human dropping. So human droppings are here because of open defecation, a very unhealthy practice. Open defecation is a very unhealthy practice if we are living in highly populated communities because our fecal matter does not have enough time to degrade and to ensure that all pathogens die before another human is exposed to it. Alrighty, and then we have contaminated water because let us say somebody pooed and in the water or the rain fell and the water brought the pathogens here. Now there is an environmental factor here in waterborne diseases. Now if a human being comes and drinks this water or a child comes and plays with this soil and then the child in or the human being ingests it, they ingest it in their mouth then this disease is called water borne disease because this is a there is a big role of environment. Thus, we can say in case of waterborne diseases, in case of waterborne diseases, we have environment. So there is a sick or patient that releases microbes in environment, and then there is a healthy individual that picks it up. Okay. So these are waterborne diseases. Instead, in case of water wash diseases, what we will have is, let us say this patient has dropped their fecal matter in environment and this healthy human who was playing around or and got exposed to this pathogens. Now these pathogens, uh, let us say are there in this healthy human's hands. The human is still healthy, but the pathogens are in the hand. Now this healthy human has two options, either to maintain a level of cleanliness or not maintain it, not maintain and usually the option that they have, the, the, the option they choose is not based upon their personal choice and awareness but upon their necessity in a country like India. People do not have water to drink let alone water to wash hand before eating meals every time. In fact, dear students, how many of you wash your hands every time before you eat? See? <laughs> so. Most if this healthy human chooses not to pr practice hygienic practices because of lack of water, then this healthy human falling sick is, um, then when the healthy human falls sick, it is called as water wash disease. Now not all diseases that are water borne can become water washed. This is important to remember because We'll, when we talk about individual diseases, I'll give you an example. The next kind of disease we have is water-based disease. So let's take a look at water-based disease. In water-based disease, the water will give a home, a habitat for a part of the organism, a type, uh, a life portion of the organism, pathogenic organism to survive. And then a human being can be transferred, uh, transmitted the disease through contact with water. 
So, for example, schistosomiasis and many other internal parasites, what they do is they live a particular portion of their life in the aquatic system. So, again, let us say I have worms or some patient has worms and they poop and the worms are washed into uh, an aquatic system. Now, these worms can need this aquatic system to fulfill a particular portion of their life, life cycle. So, th the eggs that are released, they will mature, they will grow in an aquatic system and then they are ready to be consumed. If a human being consumes at that time, then they will get fall sick. Such diseases are called water based disease. Now, water related disease are a big menace. All of these are big menace in our country. In North India, at, uh, during monsoon usually and near and after monsoon, these are diseases that are caused when there are puddles of water available because the insect that carries these diseases require this puddle of water to complete its life cycle. So, here we have insect vectors, usually mosquitoes, rely on water for habitat. Human water contact is not needed. Now, there is a big difference between water based and water related diseases. In both of the cases, the pathogenic organism and in water related cases, the vector for pathogenic organism requires to live in water to complete a portion of their life cycle. However, in water based diseases, we need to come in touch with the water. Water contact is important. In water related diseases, water contact is not important. For example, I may never go swimming and I may never touch dirty waters and dirty soil you know be very careful prudent however a mosquito can still come and bite me so whereas i can protect myself from water based diseases this way i cannot protect myself from water related diseases so think of it this way now in our environment we have a puddle so this is puddle or some water body now in this there are two kinds of organism that will be very happy to find a puddle. One is a worm, let us say, and this worm need the eggs of this worm need this water puddle to fulfill a particular portion of their life cycle. The other are mosquitoes, I do not want to draw mosquitoes. So, the other are mosquitoes who will lay eggs here and allow their eggs to turn into hatchlings. So, in this case, this when I and a human being comes and touches this water, comes in contact, contact is a very important term here. When they come in contact, human comes in contact with contaminated water, then this disease can infect them. Such kind of infections are called as water based diseases. This is really cool because some worms you do not need to ingest, you just touch it and it infiltrates through your skin. Now, these mosquitoes who have laid eggs here and their hatchlings have started flying, we do not need to come in touch, these mosquitoes will come our home. So, this is kind, kind of home delivery. <laughs> the mosquitoes will find us and if they are carrying diseases like dengue, malaria, eh, Japanese encephalitis and so on and so forth, then they will make us fall sick. Such diseases are called as water related diseases. So, now let us very quickly understand another kind of classification for pathogens. We can also divide them on basis of the domain that they come from. So, virus is neither bacteria because we do not even know if virus is alive or dead. There is a debate in biological community regarding that. So, it is definitely not bacteria, not archaea, not eukaryota. So, there are some viral pathogens. It is basically just a protein or RNA, rRNA or um, DNA in in encapsulated by the protein and then this DNA or RNA can come and infect us and other organisms. So, one is polio virus, we believe we have eliminated polio from our country completely. It causes poliomyositis which is a nervous system disorder. Then we have hepatitis A and E which causes jaundice, adenovirus which causes respiratory and eye infections and then we have many others that causes some serious diarrhea. Then in comes when it comes to bacteria, we have Salmonella typhi, infamous microbe causing typhoid, typhoid fever, Shigella causes dysentery, Vibrio cholera as the name suggests causes cholera which is really severe diarrhea, Yacina enterocolitica causes gastroenteritis. Then we have Protozoa, Entamoeba histolytica. I am from UP, many parts of UP and Uttarakhand by the way are endemic to this organism. So, there are people in my hometown that get this disease, amoebic dysentery, every 10 days, every 5 days. Then we have Giardia lambia causes Giardia diarrhea, 
cryptosporidium again causes a very severe diarrhea the cool thing with GRD and cryptosporidium is that very little amount of microorganisms are required to avoid sick so even if the water is clear but there are only few of this protozoa present then we are indexed enough to make us fall sick so when i say about cryptosporidium let's just study about cryptosporidium for today so it is a protozoa that causes serious diarrhea um, and it's found in surface drinking water especially swimming pools that have been exposed to human feces or animal feces uh, 10 10 oocysts of cryptosporidia are enough to f make us fall sick and in raw drinking water people have found up to 483 oocysts for 100 liter which is very high and we cannot detect more than this by the way so our detect we are limited by detection and this is crypto life cycle it uh, enters our endothelium and intestines and um, it grows there the trophozytes in, it nourish it's nourished and then the trophozytes when they are ready then they are se uh, secreted out in fecal matter which is here so in this fecal matter you can see some really thick walled oocysts four of them all right dear students this is all for today in the next lecture we will go ahead and talk about other pathogens and there is a long list of pathogens especially for a water starved country like India and where we have such difficulty in maintaining our water to good drinking quality standards. So we will talk not only about bacterial, viral and protozoal pathogens but we will also talk about when these pathogens become super pathogens. So that is all for today, see you in next lecture, thank you.